Hello everyone and welcome. We are ready to start our webinar now. I am Marisabel Caballero and I work as a Global Technical Manager for Poultry with EW Nutrition, a global animal nutrition company. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce our presenter, Richard Bailey, poultry health scientist with Aviogen. As you know, Aviogen is uh, our sister company and a renowned supplier of poultry genetics. Richard has uh, worked in research and development uh, for Aviogen in the last uh, decade, focusing on poultry, poultry gut health and the relationships between gut function, development, immunity, and the resident gut flora. Richard? Introduce yourself, please. Oh, I think uh, we should be having uh, some issues with uh, Richard's uh, sound. Good morning. Yes, right now it's good. <laughs> good morning, um, everybody. Um, and thank you to EW Nutrition for inviting me to talk today. Um, my name is Richard Bailey and I am a poultry health scientist working in the R&D department of Aviogen and I'm based in, in Scotland. Um, a key focus of my work is, is looking at uh, intestinal health to try and understand the, the links between uh, the host genetics, the immune system and the physiology of the gut. Um, in this presentation today I'm going to talk about intestinal health in the breeders and cover some of the funda fundamental aspects of gut health and how the science of the gut links to gut health in the field. Thanks for the introduction, Richard. Uh, Richard is uh, joined today by Etuan Mungerben, my colleague, head uh, of global technical management in EW Nutrition. Tuan. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you all attendees for joining this exciting webinar. Um, I'm uh, Tuan van Gerwe, um, poultry veterinarian and um, uh, head of the global technical management team in poultry. So uh, um, I'm really uh, happy to have uh, Richard with us today. And I hope you have an, uh, I will be uh, helping him and Isabel to answer uh, the questions that you might want to submit uh, during the webinar or after the webinar. So look, looking forward to this, to this uh, session. Thank you, Tuan. Uh, yes, uh, together we will help uh, answer uh, questions both during and after the presentation. As Richard mentioned, today's webinar will focus in uh, what we need to know about gut health in broiler breeders from brewing to laying, focusing in practical solution-oriented expertise for reducing antibiotics uh, during the whole life cycle. Questions. Your questions are very important and can be asked through the webinar in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Uh, some questions that you ask will receive instant replies from us. Some will be picked up and answered in the live discussion that will follow Richard's presentation. Also, at the end of the webinar, we kindly ask you uh, to answer our survey so we can improve our webinars in the future. It will take you less than one minute. And now, uh, let's uh, get into it. And uh, Richard, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. So in this um, webinar, I'm going to cover some of the fundamental aspects of uh, intestinal health, outline the main factors which influence intestinal health, what we can do to promote intestinal health, and just finish off with some of the key messages. When we think, when we start talking about gut health, um, I think it's very important to um, describe what we mean by intestinal health. It's a very large area, so I think it's, it's very important to just um, highlight what we mean by that. And I see it as being four specific areas. Firstly, it's the ability to defend against gut pathogens. It's the ability to break down the feed into its constituent parts. It's the ability to absorb all the digested nutrients. And it's the ability of the immune system to respond correctly to normal changes in the environment of the bird. In order for intestinal health to, um, to be good, we need to have optimal tissue development. So a nice formation of the, the gut tissues, the villi, the epithelial cells. We need to have optimal immune system development. The gut tissues of a bird has around 70% of the bird's circulating immune cells. So it's a very important immune tissue as well as being a digestive organ. 
We also need to make sure we have optimal gut microbiota development. And all of these three things work together in unison to promote gut health. If we have any failure in one of these areas, we will go down a pathway of poor gut health. So if we now think about what the gut is, it is essentially a tube that runs from the beak of the bird to the cloaca. And it's divided into very distinct regions with very distinct roles to play in the digestion process. First of all, the feed enters the crop where it is partially fermented by a population of lactobacillus bacteria. And then the feed will pass on through to the proventriculus and gizzard. Here the feed is mixed with acid and some digestive enzymes and the feed is also ground down by the gizzard. This feed is then released by the gizzard and enters the small intestine. In the small intestine, we get the, um, the final chemical digestion of the feed and we get all the absorption of the nutrients. Once the digester has passed through the small intestine, all the beneficial components, the proteins, the fats, the sugars should have been absorbed. This material is that then passes through the colon into the, um, into the environment as feces. However, some of that material, maybe once or twice a day, is passed back um, up, the, up the colon into the seeker where it will be fermented by uh, the bacteria that reside in there. So this will be plant material, cellulose, fibers that the bird can't digest. It's fermented by bacteria to produce short chain fatty acids, vitamins, organic acids, which the bird can use for extra nutrition. When it comes to the absorption of, uh, of feed, we have to look at the small intestine. This is, a small, this is a, an electron micrograph of the small intestine showing, uh, showing the villi. So these structures, the villi, are very important because they increase the surface area of the gut to get maximal absorption of nutrients. And the development of these structures is, is very important because we want these to be as long as possible. So on the next slide, I'm going to just describe how these um, structures develop and, and what we can do to promote the development. One of the key things to remember when it comes to villi development is that brooding plays a critical role in the development of these villi. At hatch, the chick comes out of the egg with a, with a small villus. And during the first four to 10 days, these villi rapidly grow. And they grow because at the bottom of the villi and in the middle of the villi, there are cells which rapidly divide. And as they divide, the villi get longer and longer. This first four to 10 days is critical because after this period, the cells that were dividing in the middle of the villi stop. They become normal epithelial cells, which means the rate of growth of the villi will slow down. And that's very important because if we lose any growth, whilst um, we have both of these growth centers active, we can never ever get that back, which is why brooding is so critical for gut health. We know that gut development starts in the egg, and so we need to make sure that incubation conditions are correct. However, this later growth of the villi after, after hatch depends on having food in the gut. So it's very important that chicks get access to feed as soon as possible. It is also stimulated by the presence of beneficial bacteria. So the use of products that can stimulate a good microbiota will help the development of the villi. This villi growth will be inhibited by stress. And by stress, we're thinking about things like poor brooding. So if it's too cold, too hot, the birds don't get, get enough access to feed. These villi will slow down and we will not have the optimal villi growth for the, for the older bird. The villi are covered by a, a single layer of epithelial cells, and this is called the gut barrier. And maintaining this gut barrier is essential for optimal gut health. Tight junctions hold these cells together. They, they, they glue the cells together, which prevents bacteria from passing from the gut lumen into the uh, gut tissues. Failure of this gut barrier, as we can see in this uh, diagram here, where we see a compromised gut, this allows the cells to, to break apart and allows bacteria to pass from the, gut tissue, from the gut lumen into the gut tissues. This can have an impact on the, the localized uh, gut tissues 
or if the bacteria get into the bloodstream, can cause systemic issues, as I'll now explain. So when we see a failure of the gut barrier, the gut function becomes impaired, we, the gut becomes inflamed, and we have a risk of further disease. So we can see on the, the image here on the right hand side, this is an example of a gut that is compromised. We can see that the, the gut cells have broken away from the, from the villi, exposing those gut tissues to the bacteria that reside in the gut. When this happens, we see a reduction in nutrient absorption, which leads to poor growth rates, nutrient deficiencies, and if the birds are not, eating, uh, are not absorbing the feed, then bacteria can utilize those nutrients and they will then overgrow. This can then lead to opportunistic infections, um, such as necrotic enteritis, spinal lesions, joint infections and leg health problems, and a very important uh, issue in breeders can be peritonitis. So we need to maintain that gut barrier. And this gut barrier is stimulated by the beneficial bacteria, um, the, the microbiota, which is a very important part of the bird system, which I'll now explain. When we think about the gut microbiota, this is a large community of bacteria that reside in the gut. All animals, birds, fish, insects, all have a gut microbiota. In the chicken, it's an estimated seven to 800 different species of bacteria that make up this community. This will be a mix of both favorable and unfavorable bacteria. And as long as the, the gut environment is, is stable and happy, we'll have more of the, the beneficial bacteria. But when we see an imbalance in the gut and we see stress in the gut, the unfavorable bacteria will start to dominate and that is when we can start to see um, issues like dysbacteriosis. This uh, community plays a major role in animal health and immune system development, protects against pathogens, and it really is essential uh, for, for the life of the bird. But it is a complex community, and, and now I'll explain how that community um, actually uh, develops. The microbiota is a dynamic entity, and it develops over time. And I always compare the development of the microbiota to the development of a forest. So if we think of the way a forest develops, we have bare ground, then we have simple plants, mosses, grasses. We start to uh, make a more fertile environment. We then get small trees and shrubs, um, which then develop into mature trees, a more stable um, ecosystem. And the same thing happens within the gut. At hatch, the gut is relatively sterile. When the bird goes onto the, comes out of the egg, onto the farm, it starts to take in bacteria, which are the pioneering species, which start to set up the gut. We then go through uh, stages of succession as this bacterial community becomes more complex until finally we get to the mature stage. Typically this will take seven to 10 days, but it can take longer. Any pressure on the gut system, any stress, uh, poor feed quality, things like that, will inhibit the, the growth of um, this development of the microbiota, and so it will take a lot longer. We can use probiotics to stimulate this, uh, this process and speed it up. By putting beneficial pioneering species into the small intestine, we start to stimulate that, that gut microbiota. An important thing to remember is when we do use antibiotics uh, against pathogens, yes, we will kill the pathogens, but also these antibiotics can have activity against the beneficial bacteria. So we always have to bear that in mind when if we have to use an antibiotic, we have to then repopulate the gut with beneficial bacteria to counteract the impact of those antibiotics. A key focus of gut health research is what happens when this, this community becomes imbalanced. And if I now describe what happens during a gut imbalance, we typically see that the microbiota changes indicate malabsorption. We have poor fat absorption, poor protein absorption, and poor sugar absorption, which means all these nutrients pass into the seeker and we have more nutrients for bacteria. This then leads to a bacterial overgrowth and we have excess carbon dioxide, methane, hydrogen sulfide produced, um, which produces those gassy cecal contents. When bacteria 
start to metabolize proteins. They can produce toxic amines, which irritate the gut and can cause growth, growth depression. Some bacteria break down the bile acids, um, which are very important because these are the things that allow fat and water to mix so that fat can be absorbed. So when we lose the bile acids, we impair fat absorption. And then when we have that bacterial overgrowth, it can cause an immune response resulting in a leaky gut. This of course then leads to further disruption and intervention is needed to re rebalance the gut. But one, one very important thing to remember is that during this dysbacteriosis cycle, there are many things that can trigger this. And the result of, of any of these triggers will be a dysbacteriosis. So the outcome is always the same. However, the, the initial triggers can be different, which we'll now go into. So when we think about the factors that influence gut health, it really is everything. We have the ventilation and temperature on the farm, litter quality, water quality, um, aspects of the feed, gut development, infection, medication, uh, biosecurity, stress. All of these factors can have an impact on the gut and they can be additive. And this additive effect is very important. And the reason it's important is because I, I believe that the gut has a threshold. It has a threshold at which it can cope with a certain amount of pressure. But if you go over that threshold, that is when we would start to see a gut health problem. So if we think, for example, we have a, we have a flock where they've had poor gut development, poor water quality, and they've had some handling stress. They're at reaching the tip of that threshold. And then we go and do a, a feed change, for example. We know that feed changes will alter the gut and will alter the microbiota, and that's enough to push the gut over its threshold and we start to see a problem. And this is very important because we might start pointing fingers at, at the feed and say the feed is an issue. However, it's all the things underneath um, that line which has actually pushed the gut to its limit. So we have to think about everything when it comes to, um, to gut health and all the factors that can impact upon, upon the bird. So if we think about some of the individual factors, stress can have a big impact on gut health. This can be from physical or environmental factors. <clears throat> We know that stress can cause immunosuppression, which can impact upon immune development and disease susceptibility. But also when we're stressed or birds are stressed, we release certain hormones and neurotransmitters into the gut, which can cause an increase in the growth and activity of some, of the, of some bacteria in the gut, which I've list, listed here. And this increased activity can result in um, increased growth, increased virulence, which can have a, take an impact upon the intestinal tract. And so during stressful periods, it can be very useful to use gut health additives um, to reduce the overgrowth of these bacteria. If we now think about uh, the impact of nutrition, uh, feed form is a very important aspect uh, when it comes to nutrition. If the feed, uh, what happens is the feed comes through the proventriculus, gets mixed with acid and pepsin, uh, which digests protein. And whilst the feed is being ground in the gizzard, the acid and the pepsin pre-digests the protein so it's ready for the small intestine. If the particle size is too small or the pellet quality is not good enough, that feed will not stay in the gizzard for a long enough period of time and we get inefficient protein preparation. This protein then goes into the hindgut, impacts upon gut viscosity, results in poor absorption, poor feed utilization, and it can really impact upon the performance of the bird. Infection is obviously a very important thing when it comes to gut health. And this can be uh, whether it's clinical infection or subclinical infection at all ages from viruses, bacteria, and parasites. And it's very important to, to always keep an eye out for, for subclinical infections because we may not see an increase in mortality but we may see a reduction in performance. And one of the best things we can do to reduce infection in flocks is to have good biosecurity and good vaccination protocols to, to really promote the overall health of the bird and the gut health of the bird. Another very key thing to think about, especially as we're going into an era where we're reducing uh, antimicrobial use, is water quality. 
I often um, find that this is an area that is overlooked, but gut health really relies on the provision of good quality water because water can be a source of pathogen challenges, whether it's bacteria, viruses, micro mycoplasma. And also the, the pH and mineral content of the water can first influence the physiology of the gut, but it can also impact upon the activity of bacteria. So for example, if we have a lot of iron or manganese or zinc in the water, that can actually promote bacterial growth. E. coli, for example, loves iron. So if we have more iron in the water, chances are you will have a greater proliferation of E. coli. And so having a good water sanitation protocol is essential for gut health throughout the life of the breeder. And to put it in, in sort of a simple, straightforward um, sort of guideline, between flocks, we need to make sure we remove biofilm and scale from the water lines using uh, hydrogen peroxide and, and acids. Through the life of the flock, we want to ensure the water is sanitized with things like chlorine, chlorine dioxide, sodium hydroxide, which will kill any bacteria that may enter through the water. Also, it's a very good idea to just acidify the water. The gut will work better um, in a slightly acidic environment. Um, and also acids are more like, an acidic environment is more likely to inhibit the growth of the bacteria we don't want to be um, in the bird. And so I would typically recommend around a pH of 5.5 to 6.5. Also, very important throughout the life of the, bro uh, the breeder to flush the lines every six to eight weeks. Because even though we may be sanitizing the water going into the water lines, bacteria can work their way up a nipple line or, or coat um, a bell drinker. So it's very important to, to make sure that those bacterial biofilms are removed. So if we think about overall um, gut health, what is the actual impact of of poor gut health on the breeder. And firstly, poor gut health will reduce nutrient uptake, which means there's less nutrients for growth and egg production. If the gut doesn't function properly, the immune system won't be functioning properly. So we'll have poor anti antibody deposition in the egg. We also would end up with poor flock uniformity. And if we have malabsorption, as I've mentioned, we will have bacterial overgrowth. If we have poor gut integrity, this will of course allow bacteria to pass into the bloodstream, which can cause infectious joint diseases or peritonitis. And if we do have a bacterial imbalance in the gut, it can impact upon the egg. When the egg passes through the cloaca, it comes into contact with any residual gut bacteria. So if we have poor gut health, these bacteria can come in contact with the egg. This, these egg, this bacteria can then impact upon embryo, which may impact upon fertility and hatchability, or it can have an impact on uh, day-old chick quality. So we need to really promote that gut health um, in the breeder. And now I'll just explain a few ways how we can promote gut health. So when it comes to promoting gut health um, in a post-antibiotic use era, we often hear about products that are referred to as alternatives to antibiotics. Now, this is a term that I'm not overly um, overly, uh, uh, um, I don't really like this term because it gives, the, um, it gives the impression that we can use these products like antibiotics. Um, whereas most of these products tend to be prophylactic rather ther than therapeutic. We often have to tailor make pro programs from farm to farm. And we do see flock to flock variations depending on the, the sort of seasonal impacts and, and, and differences um, from year round. So I always think that a better way to phrase this is alternative strategies, because with these products, we're really looking at how we can um, use them at different points in the bird's life to, uh, to, to help the birds with what they need. So when it comes to a strategy, I see that there's three, three main parts to the, the gut um, life of a bird. First, it's the development phase where we're setting up the gut tissues, the gut immunity, and the gut microbiota setting the bird up for its entire life. We then have the transition phase where the, the gut is prone to changes. And this can be when we have a feed change, when we have vaccinations, when we have environmental changes, or when we handle the birds. During this, these phases, we can get bacterial overgrowth. So what we look to do during this phase is to prevent reduction in nutrient absorption 
and overgrowth of any less favorable bacteria. The last phase is the maintenance phase where the gut has developed, we have a stable microbiota, and we're really looking to promote integrity. So we want to use products that can support the gut and, and conserve this homeostasis. So if we think about what we can do um, on a, uh, when it comes to products, I think everyone will be well aware of the vast array of different products out there on the market. Um, these can be phytogenic products or plant extracts, um, direct fed microbials such as probiotics or competitive exclusion products, organic acids such as uh, the traditional acids or protected acids, uh, which can either stimulate the gut tissues or inhibit pathogens. We have prebiotics, which provide a dedicated nutrient source to the beneficial bacteria. Uh, Manan oligosaccharides, which uh, the MOS products, which can inhibit the um, adherence of E. coli and salmonella to the gut wall. Bacterial and yeast fermentation products, which um, have a lot of beneficial metabolites, which can stimulate the immune system um, and the gut environment. And I've put feed enzymes in here as a gut health product because if we have anything that can help digestion and, and make nutrients more available for the, for the bird to absorb, then that will benefit gut health. So when we think about which product should we actually use, we have to think about the mode of action. What do we want that product to do? Do we want it to improve gut integrity? Do we want it to stimulate the beneficial flora? Do we want to improve gut development, improve gut function, inhibit pathogens? This is a question you have to ask when you're trying to de decide which product to do, to, to choose. Make sure it's a product that will fulfill your requirements and give the required support to the gut of the bird. And usually when you start asking these questions, you, can, you will be told what the products will do and it will inform your decision. <clears throat> so if now if we think about um, what happens on the, uh, on the farm, how can we practically promote gut health? In the development phase, um, in the early life of the bird, we can influence gut health from day one. The fundamental management of chicks is very important. So we need to ensure they get good access to feed and water as soon as possible to stimulate the development of the gut and promote the villi growth. Make sure the brooding temperatures are correct so they're not getting too hot or too cold, so they're not getting stressed, and also that they want to, to, to search out food and water to get all those nutrients in. We can also provide gut health products to boost early gut development, inhibit pathogens, and seed the gut with beneficial bacteria. By doing this, we're setting up the bird, uh, setting up the gut um, for the whole bird's life so that they're better equipped to cope with any gut challenge as they get, um, get older. We then move on to the next phase of, the gut, of gut health, the transition phase. This is a period when the gut is at risk of becoming imbalanced. As I mentioned earlier, feed changes, vaccinations, environmental changes, handling. And so all of these factors can, uh, can result in a gut imbalance. And so firstly, one thing we can do is minimize the number of intestinal stresses at one time to prevent overloading the gut. So for example, you would not do a feed change and then grading on the same day. That would put too much pressure on the gut. You'd be better to stagger those kinds of events. We can also use gut health additives over risk periods. So for example, say that we have at day 24 a feed change. If we go in with a, a product like a, a phytogenic or a, a probiotic or organic acid um, at day 23, 24, 25, and 26, we're offering a buffering capacity to the gut to prevent the potential overgrowth of the less favorable bacteria. So this is a strategic use of of a gut health product over a risk period. And this can be done over any risk periods at all. We then go on to um, the maintenance phase. Once the gut is fully developed and, and it's, everything is, is doing what it should be, we want to, to maintain that. We want to support gut health so that, that it, we can keep on, on performing for the bird. But of course, there are key periods during the later life of the bird where the gut not, might need extra support. Around peak production, when the bird is under a lot of metabolic and physiological pressure from producing a lot of eggs, 
We can use extra organic acids in the water just to, to give the gut a boost. But we can also support the gut with, with products like probiotics and phytogenics, um, which can be daily administration in the feed or water, or we can do it uh, weekly um, just in the water. We can it's always important to try and find a system that works best for, for your farms, for your flocks, um, to, to make sure that that gut is supported around peak production. After peak production, 30 weeks onwards, gut integrity um, can decrease with age, which opens the gut up for an increased risk of bacterial translocation across the gut wall, which of course can lead to, to leg health issues and peritonitis. So we can increase the, the products that can boost gut integrity. One of the good things that works to increase gut integrity in the older, broiler, uh, older breeder is butyric acid. That strengthens those tight junctions which holds the gut, gut cells together, and so it just reduces that risk of bacterial translocation. Well, one thing that is, is essential when it comes to maintaining gut health is looking at gut health on a daily basis. Especially in the era that we're in with, with reduced antibiotic usage, we, we need to make sure we, we're aware of any minor changes in the gut health of the birds um, so that we can intervene uh, with uh, some of these um, probiotics, organic acids, um, phytogenics, so that, we, that things don't get so bad that we need to start using antimicrobials. And so now I'm going to show you the, the easiest way to assess gut health in the flock. And it is, of course, looking at the, the fecal droppings. The feces are a great indicator of gut health. So on the, on the left, we have uh, good fecal and cecal droppings. Um, the cecal droppings need to look dark brown in color, have a toothpaste-like consistency, and be free of gas. The fecal dropping needs to be semi-solid uh, bolus with a white, ur white uric acid cap that we can see here. If you walk into your shed and all you can see is gut droppings, then you do not have a gut health problem. If you walk into your shed and you see droppings like on the right here, where we have gassy cecal droppings, wet uh, fecal droppings, mucus in the droppings, feed passage, that tells you you have a gut health problem. And the minute you see some of these droppings in a shed, it's very important to act quickly. And when we see this kind of, um, these kinds of droppings, we, the simplest thing that we can do is just start to run some extra organic acids or phytogenic products through the water just to support that gut and inhibit any pathogens. And you can do this for about three to four days. And the reason that I say three to four days is that that is the time it generally takes for the villi to completely renew the, the epithelial surface. So after three to four days, the villi uh, in the gut will be covered by new intestinal cells and the gut should then be working back, uh, back to normal. If we leave it too long and we ignore these, these slight changes in the feces when we first start to see them, that is when a problem can get uh, more extreme and that is when we might have to go down the pathway of using antimicrobials, which of course we don't want to do. So to finish, I'll just highlight the, the, the key messages. We need to ensure optimal brooding to promote the best gut development. We need to understand what the gut needs at each time point in the bird's life. Good gut health relies on having optimal water sanitation and also feed formulation and quality is very important for good gut health and performance. We need to know when the gut is at risk of imbalance and we need to support the gut accordingly. And very importantly, we need to react quickly when we see a problem before it becomes more serious and we need to do more serious interventions. And with that, I thank you for listening and we'll move on to the questions and answers. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for such an interesting presentation. Um, now uh, we will start our uh, question and answer uh, section. And uh, uh, yes, uh, we have uh, many uh, interesting uh, questions uh, right now in our panel. Uh, so I ask uh, uh, Tuan to start uh, with the session. Yeah, I will first go um, um, for a question which is about uh, the use of additives and how it may affect uh, 
the, uh, the efficacy of day-old vaccination for coccidiosis? Is there any risk of inactivating the vaccine? Um, this is definitely something to, uh, to verify because um, um, uh, there's most of the additives that are out there do not have a direct anti-coccidial effect. Definitely, obviously uh, probiotics will not, but also only, only very few phytomolecules will have uh, um, a truly anti-coccidial effect. So um, um, it's always important to verify this with the supplier and uh, ask for this. Um, obviously, and I think that's the reason behind this question, a recirculation of the uh, coccidiosis vaccine strain is a critical uh, factor in developing active immunity. So uh, um, although some level of uh, uh, anti-coccidial effect might be desirable, particularly in um, when there is wet, wet conditions and uh, very strong uh, recirculation of Imeria strains, uh, so it is very, uh, let's say, uh, conditional on the situation, but um, uh, you have to check for this, definitely. Uh, but, but in general, I can say most additives are not uh, anti-coccidial enough to, um, to uh, negatively affect a well-executed and well-circulating um, coccidiosis vaccine strategy. Okay. Um... I'll answer a question on um, that says, do you recommend the use of probiotics in the hatchery um, and first days for faster development of the microbiome or um, and which strains to use? Um, absolutely. If we can get probiotics into the birds um, in the hatchery, that it, that is brilliant because the quicker we get probiotics into the gut, the quicker they start colonizing and the quicker they start stimulating the gut tissues. Um, it is always a very good idea to then follow up on farm um, just to make sure that all the birds get a good dose of, of the bacteria. And in terms of strains, um, I would always um, go for lactobacillus based products or enterococcus based products, which um, colonize the intestinal tract of chickens very quickly and start to produce um, beneficial acids, which will stimulate uh, the gut tissues. Um, another question um, I see is why is acidifying the water between pH 5.5 and 6.5 an advantage? Is there not a risk of algae production in the drinking lines? Um, the reason that acidifying the water between 5.5 and 6.5 is an advantage is because the bacteria like uh, Salmonella, E. coli, Clostridium perfringens, um, they don't like an acidic environment. So if we acidify the water, it inhibits uh, uh, potential pathogen growth. But also, if we, if we acidify the water, we then have a, a slight impact on the pH in the gut. And if we can lower the pH in the gut um, slightly, that actually helps um, fat absorption because fat will emulsify um, and mix with the bile acids a lot better when it's slightly acidic. And in terms of algae production, that, that is a very good point. Um, algae and fungi will grow in acidic environments, but that's really when we start taking the acid level to down to something like 3.5 or 4. Um, if I can take one here. Um, uh, so looking, um, oh yeah, there was one question about how we can limit the, um, how technically we can limit the impact of feed restriction. Um, there's definitely feed restriction in broader breeders leads to a very daily dynamic in uh, nutrients being available for the microbiome. So uh, um, only half of the day the gut is filled with uh, nutrients and the other half of the day there is an empty gut, which is, as you all know, uh, negatively impacting gut integrity. So um, uh, there is, uh, um, you can consider gut health gut health additives to support the gut health, um, but also um, the use of um, diluted diets has been applied um, in broiler breeders. And even nowadays, you see a trend looking at, with producers looking into feeding uh, breeders in production uh, twice a day to also have uh, less of this uh, restriction effect on the, uh, on the, uh, on the night period. I'll take a, another one. Um, 
a question here, a good one. Are there any differences between chlorine species and can resistance develop in time and should we change them periodically? Um, yes, there are differences in, in chlorine type um, and the way that the different chlorine um, molecules work. So for example, if we use um, free chlorine like uh, sodium hypochlorite or uh, calcium hypochlorite, <clears throat> typically we need to have a much higher PPM um, than we would for something like chlorine dioxide. Um, the, the hypochlorite ions dissociate into hypochlorous acid, which um, will kill off um, pathogens. Um, so one of the key things there is we need to have an acidic environment for that chlorine to work. Chlorine dioxide, on the other hand, has a different mode of action and it uses electron exchange in order to, to kill um, pathogens. And it, it is a lot more forgiving of, um, of pH. And also chlorine dioxide will penetrate organic matter, whereas the hypochlorite ions will not penetrate organic matter. So if we have water with a lot of debris, you would want to use chlorine dioxide. In terms of resistance, um, never say never with, with bacteria, but we don't typically see a lot of resistance to, to chlorine because it's, it really is um, a, a stressful uh, chemical to use within bacteria. Um, the, um, another question, how is gut health related to lake health problems and how this can, uh, and how can we solve this? Well, as I described in the presentation, when we start to see a breakdown of that gut barrier, um, bacteria like uh, Staphylococcus, uh, E. coli can enter into the gut tissues and enter the bloodstream. When they get into the bloodstream, they then can find their way to the bones um, where there's a very nice um, environment for those bacteria to start to colonize and they can then start to degrade the bone. Um, and so we have to maintain that gut integrity throughout the entire life of the bird um, in order to, to reduce uh, the risk of those leg health problems occurring. And things like the, the phytogenics, the um, probiotics, which, which try and stimulate the gut um, barrier and, and gut health will, will help with that. Okay, uh, very good. I see a lot of um, uh, questions or, um, or a lot of doubts uh, by uh, the use of organic acids, uh, both in uh, water lines and uh, in feed. And uh, uh, some of them, uh, some of the questions are related uh, with the acidification of, um, of the intestine. And uh, um, in this regard, I would like to say that to really uh, change uh, the pH of the intestine, you certainly need a large quantity uh, of uh, added organic acids. So um, the effect uh, of, um, uh, let's say, especially not protective organic acids uh, at intestinal level is uh, very low. Um, I'll have a question here on uh, E. coli infections in breeders. As they sometimes happen at the onset of production, with peritonitis and mortality, are they caused by enteric challenge or respiratory challenge? So, uh, very good question, a very difficult one, uh, because um, um, we know historically that respiratory challenges, uh, uh, predisposing factors, are, um, are, um, are a factor here. Um, think about mycoplasma as one example, but also uh, uh, viral infections, and even um, not so much in breeders, but in broilers, even and some hot strains of vaccines have been shown to uh, provoke uh, E. coli bacillosis, um, coli bacillosis. Um, but yeah, Richard is also uh, rightfully referring to enteric challenge being uh, a, a potential factor here because we know that if gut integrity gets impaired, that um, E. coli could also um, uh, go into the body via the, via the damaged or compromised gut and cause this um, systemic infection of uh, peritonitis. Obviously, as we all know, the onset of production and the, um, the, the, the stress that that provokes on the bird is another factor. So may, maybe similar to what Richard was saying for multifactorial uh, effects that at the end um, is, um, leads to a dis 
equilibrium, a disbalance, uh, that can also very much be considered for respiratory, for E. coli. There's also some indications that certain E. coli are actually uh, primary pathogens, so they have the ability to infect uh, breeders and broilers uh, without any predisposing factors. So um, it's a very complex matter. One question about proper development of villi, how many times we have to feed in the brooding periods and first week of life. I think that, uh, um, um, yeah, feeding is one thing, but I think they, uh, they, they, they have to be fed at libitum with, uh, with, a, with a good uh, pellet, uh, sorry, feed presentation, so physical form to, uh, to stimulate it and having a abundant presence of feed and drinking water to provoke early feed intake in, in brooding period time. It's the typical, really the typical brooding best practice, I would say. Um, the question here, uh, which is the best chemical for flushing the water lines? Um, one of the best things we can use is uh, sodium hydroxide um, that really penetrates the biofilm and will loosen um, you know, that, that, that film that the bacteria produce. So using about 50 ppm of of sodium hydroxide will um, will clean that water line. Uh, question on ingredient particle size recommended for each stage. Um, yeah, I would say um, there's different situations here, but um, particle size in the actual feed that the bird is consuming is very critical for gut health. And uh, it's good to have a certain minimum amount of particle sizes that are bigger than one millimeter. So uh, uh, another there is a recommendation from, from Ross nutritionist saying that 30% would be advisable. Uh, uh, and this is actually true uh, for, uh, for every age category. Of course, when we look at very small animals, we have to uh, avoid uh, using uh, a too high particle size. So above two and a half millimeter, for example, but um, typically, you would feed them a, a, a crumble and a, or a very small pellet at that time. So I would say uh, also be aware that the pelleting process is actually another grinding process. So uh, to understand particle size as perceived by the bird, you need to dissolve the pellet and, uh, and, and, and determine particle size distribution uh, after that step. Um, another question here, does uh, water hardness have an impact on gut health? Um, yes, um, typically when you have harder, wa harder water, it tends to be, um, have a higher pH, um, which I've already described can promote the activity of uh, potential pathogens. But also if we have harder water, you're more likely to lay down a lime scale in the water lines, which can provide a very nice um, surface for bacteria to grow. Um, and so if you have hard water, it can be very beneficial to use um, acids to just bring that pH down and dissolve some of those, uh, um, those chemicals, the, the calcium carbonate that makes the water hard. I have a question about uh, the impact of uh, mycotoxins in uh, villa development. And uh, yes, of course, uh, we need to take that into account uh, when, um, when we are um, assessing uh, or evaluating the quality uh, of uh, feed ingredients uh, and, uh, of course, uh, take um, the relevant measures. Uh, which mycotoxins can affect um, villa development? Well, uh, trichotoxins in general, so like uh, DON, T2, uh, DAS, etc. Uh, also, uh, even uh, mycotoxins uh, such as uh, aflatoxin have demonstrated to have an impact uh, in the microbiota as well. So uh, to have an integrated uh, mycotoxin management uh, would be uh, the best. Um, another question here. In breeder flocks that perform to breed standards, do you expect that gut health is compromised or would these flocks not benefit from application of gut health additives? 
Um, I think we have, in, in this case, we have to always remember that there are challenges out there in the farm environment. Um, and so I always think that any flock will benefit from uh, gut health additives. And also remember a lot of these products are prophylactic. So we're setting up the gut and, and maintaining gut health um, before, um, so a problem does not occur. We're not using them typically to, to solve problems. So I think in, in any flock, um, we, we will get a benefit from, from gut health additives. Uh, can we elaborate on the alternative strategies uh, for antibiotics? Well, um, uh, first, uh, to uh, have a uh, reduction uh, on antibiotics in general, in poultry production, uh, requires uh, more than adding uh, um, a, substitute, a substitute product. And I think uh, this was uh, also part of uh, Richard's uh, presentation. So we need uh, to take uh, an, uh, an integrated strategy, multidisciplinary strategy, including biosecurity, including water and feed quality, and so on. Uh, as uh, uh, for alternatives, uh, of course, uh, when, uh, when you think about improving gut health, you need a very good uh, nutrition and teeth formulation, very good uh, raw material quality, and uh, you can also help the animals with a certain uh, ingredients or feed additives uh, such as uh, phytomolecules, for example, or phy phytogenic uh, um, products, uh, but uh, as well, uh, and uh, during certain periods, uh, as uh, Richard mentioned, uh, we can also recommend uh, the use of pro and prebiotics uh, and other uh, alternatives as well. I'll take the next one for um, which is a nutritional question on breeder nutrition. If mesh feed is better than pelleted feed. Um, I, um, it's a little bit related with the question I just addressed, but I, I would say that for breeders, uh, mesh feed is the desirable one. Of course, um, the uh, hygiene of the feed needs to be managed, but that can be done with the, with the modern technology. Um, can be done very well. It's providing... Um, uh, more feeding time, so you have a more um, balanced feed intake uh, across the across the birds in the flock. So feeding time can double from uh, from a pelleted feed. So you have less concerns there, and also it is easier to provide a large particle size in a mesh diet than than in a pellet. And therefore, uh, the development of the gizzard is improved. And through a better gizzard development, you also will see more. Um, uh, peristaltic movements and and consequently a better starch and protein digestibility so less nutrients that will reach the hindgut and feed potentially pathogenic bacteria in that part of the gut so also uh, um, therefore uh, one of the preventive factors to develop loose droppings A, there's a question here on uh, on probiotics. Um, should we use multi-strain or single strain? Um, I think it depends on on what the, the probiotic is aiming to do. But I think typically for getting um, the best um, early colonization, um, you know, it can be beneficial to use multi-strain because often um, these bacteria will work together. Um, but most of the, the good probiotics out there, whether they're single or, or multi-strain, have been researched and, and you will get uh, data to show you know, the benefits they can have on the birds. I think, um, um, I think it, it, it really depends on, on what you aim for the product to do. With the lactobacillus products, where we're looking for colonization, um, I think multi-strain works well, but if we're using things like the bacillus products, where you might have a product that's targeting uh, Clostridium uh, perfringens, for example, then if that single strain works, then um, then go with that product. Uh, we have a, a, a couple of minutes more uh, to answer uh, the last questions. Um, question here, uh, can butyric acid synthesized in the hindgut have an influence on the integrity throughout the, the gut through reverse peristalsis? 
Um, that's a good question and absolutely. Um, when we think about the, the chicken gut, we often just think about it being you know, one way traffic from the, um, in the direction from mouth to, to cloaca. However, during the life of the bird, especially in breeders, we do get reverse peristalsis. Um, so if we have um, butyric acid being produced in the, in the seeker, um, that can be then released into the, the colon where it will then be passed up um, into the, the small intestine and give some, some benefit. Um, I see um, a couple of questions. There's uh, actually a few of them that all talk about this issue of loose droppings at the start of production. So it, we know it's a common issue in, in breeder production and it's definitely a multifactorial issue. I think it, it uh, no, I know it is like uh, related with that dysproctiosis cycle that uh, um, Richard also mentioned. So uh, in it, its solution lies in a, in, in, in a multifactorial approach, looking at the prevention of pathogens to enter into the, into the, into the um, population of birds. Um, there is definitely uh, some uh, uh, sus suspected pathogens that, that can contribute to, to the loose droppings there. Um, Brachyspira being one of them, difficult to diagnose. Definitely feed composition um, and feed structure is an important factor here as well. Um, I would also say water quality, and it's been discussed at large in this, in this webinar, is a very important risk factor as well at that point of time. And general management factor, like um, um, uh, how quickly are birds brought into production can also through the, um, through the stress uh, hormone effect uh, in, impact this. Um, there, I, I believe that uh, besides these uh, factors, um, there is a definite need for uh, higher, temporary, higher support with gut health additives. And we prefer to supply extra uh, uh, concentration of uh, gut health additives, uh, in our case, phytomolecules via the drinking water in this specific period higher enteric challenge. Well, um, uh, thank you very much uh, for your questions. Uh, we have uh, uh, now only uh, two minutes uh, for for the hour, and uh, I know that there are still uh, questions on answer on our uh, Q&A box. We apologize uh, for not being able to deal with all of them during the session. However, we will be more than happy to pick up our conversation via email. So if you write uh, to our uh, webinar at ewnutrition.com email, uh, your questions will be wrote to us. Also, uh, the recording of this webinar uh, will be available uh, soon in our website. Um, you can also, and uh, we would like uh, you to join our uh, next uh, webinars. Uh, we have uh, more of them uh, coming up in the next uh, few weeks. So if you follow our uh, website or LinkedIn channel, uh, you can uh, keep uh, updated and registered. And uh, don't forget uh, our questionnaire uh, that is uh, coming up uh, right away. So I would uh, like you to spend uh, the last minute with us uh, answering our poll. Uh, your feedback is very, very welcome. Uh, thanks for attending and uh, thanks uh, for uh, your questions. <laughs>